set my goal in life to uh, teach and coach at the high school level. I didn't do that either after a while. But, um, but the, the other really important thing that happened that I can accredit Cal Poly is I met my wife there. And I met her the, uh, in the fall of 1962. And if I'd gone to UOP, that would never would have happened. So I, I'm really, really glad I went to Cal Poly. But coming to Cal Poly in 1960, or 1959, I joined a, a very talented uh, group of young men uh, forming the freshman football team. Tom Lee was our coach, and Walt Williamson was our assistant coach. And uh, we had an outstanding year and went undefeated, and we're all hunger, hungry to join the varsity the following year. The fall of 1959, Cal Poly football was, had a very strong year. They had a great senior core, and they were losing some great talent in Rich Max and Pat Lovell and, and uh, uh, Gonzalez and uh, Willie Hill were some of the real stalwarts. So by the time we arrived at the varsity scene, there were only eight, eight seniors left, and we were mostly a sophomore and a junior uh, football team with a powerhouse schedule. You know, you make football schedules years in advance, and so by the time we hit that year, we had Bowling Green, Brigham Young University, Adams State uh, on our schedule. But we were uh, eager and uh, raring to go, and so we started the year with high hopes uh, of having a very successful season. Uh, we opened the season flying to Brigham Young University in Provo, and that was a very uh, uneventful uh, trip. We flew a four-engine uh, airplane. Um, we got beat by uh, Brigham Young, which is a Division I school at that time and still is. Came home, uh, uh, beat San Diego State at a time when they were beatable. <laughs> and then uh, entertained Montana State, uh, which we lost in a close game. Then we visited Fresno and got beat. So we stayed out of town another week and went to Long Beach and got beat. So we were looking forward to staying out of town for a while. But, uh, and so our next uh, uh, opponent on our schedule was Bowling Green University. And Bowling Green, at the, in those times, was uh, ranked number one or two in the nation for the small colleges. So we knew we were in for a, a, a great challenge in, in our lives. They were also led by this uh, young running back who was a senior for them by the name of Bernie Casey. Some of you remember that Bernie went on to be a, a star for the San Francisco 49ers, but we didn't let that bother us. We just didn't read the clippings. So we had a, actually we had a great trip to Bowling Green. We were a little surprised and we uh, took the bus down to Santa Maria and walked up and saw this small plane, this two-engine C-46, which looked a lot different than what we took to Provo. But what the heck, you know, I was 19. Who, who at 19 knows any better? You know, you just point us and we go. So uh, we had a great trip back. We, uh, in, those, in those days, the route to Toledo was through Albuquerque, Kansas City, and then to Toledo. Uh, we played an afternoon game uh, at Bowling Green University, and uh, our quarterback, Ted Tallner, had an outstanding game. He set a school record for a single game passing record. The only problem was it was between the two 20-yard lines. Uh, we only scored one touchdown, and they uh, unfortunately scored 56 points. So we were ready to go home. You know, we'd been on the road for three weeks, and it was time we come back to Mustang Stadium. So leaving uh, the campus of Bowling Green and taking the bus ride back to the airport in Toledo, it was, uh, it was one of those nights that we see on the Central Coast a lot. It was very uh, low, low ceiling of clouds, of uh, fog. Uh, could hardly see the road. Uh, it was hard to see anything uh, as we were going to the airport. Some of us were a little concerned about the, um, uh, the judgment about taking off in conditions like that since you could hardly see the, the terminal from the parking lot. Um, Coach Hughes, 
um, conferred with the pilot and the co-pilot and came back onto the plane and told us that everything looked okay and we'll give it the old college try. And in those days, uh, if you recall, the uh, Federal Aviation Agency uh, couldn't prevent aircraft from taking off at an airport, but they could prevent you from landing. They could reroute you, but it was really the call of the pilot and the airline company about the decision to take off. And uh, I learned a lot after the crash and doing all the reading and the report and all the investigations and learned a lot about why people make those kinds of decisions. Ultimately, it's economics, um, about, about how much is it going to cost if we lay over and, and take care of these, uh, these young men. So the decision was made to take off. And um, we didn't know any better. Uh, we just uh, trusted the wisdom of those people who, who had the ability and the responsibility to make those kinds of decisions. Um, I happened to be uh, seating, sitting with uh, my good friend Russ Woods, uh, another survivor. Uh, we uh, camped out on the wing. We always like to sit on the wing, um, and uh, which was right outside our window was the, uh, one of the engines. And um, I had read somewhere that sitting on the wing is one of the safest places to sit. I didn't any better. I'd only flown one other time. So I wasn't a, seri a serious uh, flyer, but that's what I learned, and so that's where I sat. Uh, as we uh, prepared for takeoff, um, uh, some people were talking about the conditions, and uh, we were very concerned about the decision to go, but we had really no authority to make any particular statement or judgment about that. On taxiing down the runway, um, we noticed the plane was uh, weaving back and forth a little bit more than normal. A C-46 isn't a real big plane, and so it is subject to a little more, more movement than, than the larger aircraft. Uh, as I read later in the, uh, in the uh, report in the congressional record after all the federal hearings, following the litigation uh, uh, period, what, uh, what actually happened that as we were taxiing down the runway, uh, the plane started to drift off of the runway and crossed over the, the runway lights. And as a result, uh, the plane lifted prematurely. Um, we didn't have enough ground speed to properly do an, a proper airlift. And uh, so we were airborne. Uh, probably it's estimated to 150 to 200 feet off the ground when the left engine sputtered and, st and quit. Um, we were sitting by that engine and became very aware of it. Um, I recall, I don't recall any noises or sounds from any of my teammates at that point. All I remember is kind of hunching down in, the, in my seat and felt the plane start to drop. And fortunately or unfortunately, that's the last I remembered. I don't remember the impact at all. I don't remember the immediate turmoil and the, um, and the fire and, and all of the rescue efforts going on at that point. The, my next uh, recollection was I was laying on the runway. I'd been thrown out of the plane where, where the plane impacted. As it started to fall, it flipped over and hit on the nose and a left wing, and then the tail section broke off right behind where we were sitting. So those of us 